So yeah, today I, uh, I'm very happy uh, to uh, host you know, uh, this lecture from uh, Professor Li Jianhui. So before we start, so I think I would like to thank the people that have organized this talk, especially Zana Rana, who is you now uh, I've prepared all the agenda. Uh, of course, the BH and, and Patricia LB with uh, you know, the uh, organization of all the talk uh, and the GCSN, Daniel and, and for all the, the work beyond the uh, hybrid uh, um, conference online, okay? Uh, so I'm going to now um, try to introduce uh, uh, Li Jian. Uh, we you know, coming from China today and uh, that's no, really a great pleasure to have him. So Li Jian, I've, I've done his PhD in Shanghai. Yeah. Uh, he got his PhD in 2003 uh, at the Institute of Biochemistry and Cellular Biology. Then uh, he went to do a postdoc uh, in the Institute of Molecular Pathology uh, in Vienna, where he stayed five years, and he has his speech very well jammed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, so after that, um, so after that, he went back to um, to, to China, where he uh, in uh, 2009 became a professor and principal investigator again at the Institute of Biochemistry and Cellular Biology. Uh, he became in 2016 uh, deputy director of the Bio Research Innovation Center uh, and also uh, associate director in the State Key Laboratory of on Cell Biology. And now uh, he's an assistant director of the IBCB. And of course, no, I think what is important for us today is the incredible track record of the region on uh, liver biology and liver research regeneration and, and cell based therapy. Mm -hmm. So I really look forward to your talk event. Thank you very much okay. for joining us. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you for uh, Ludovic's uh, introduction and also the invitation to come here. Uh, uh, it's uh, really nice uh, to, to be here and uh, share with you guys what we are doing in Shanghai. Uh, so before I start my talk, I would like to uh, actually uh, show a little bit uh, uh, the dream in the lab. So this is uh, actually we uh, transplanted the human hepatocytes, which was uh, uh, expanded in our lab to this uh, uh, model. So you see here like uh, the red stuff are human hepatocytes, the green are the uh, mouse liver, and basically this mouse, uh, without any uh, human healthy cell tra uh, hepatocyte transplantation, uh, they will die. But with uh, the transplantation of uh, our cells, our hepatocytes, they survive. So we, our dream is that one day we will transplant these uh, human hepatocytes to human patients. So in a way, we really can kill all these uh, patients with uh, 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 end stage liver failure or other genetic disease. So <clears throat> by saying all this, I actually am talking about uh, regenerative medicine. And uh, by any chance, uh, because I have this uh, uh, pain for my talk for many a long time, but by any chance, I realized. Uh, uh, the lecture we are having now is in this uh, Kranaha uh, house, and it's the same Kranaha as I learned uh, before the talk. So it's really like uh, I have some kind of connections with uh, this uh, this uh, institute. So in this uh, paint, uh, it's uh, mainly described the fountain of youth. It's a kind of uh, uh, fairy tales uh, of uh, South Europe, and it tells like uh, when you are getting old, and then you pass through this fountain use, you regain all this energy and you are getting young and enjoy your life again. I think that's the kind of uh, uh, describe what uh, the regenerative medicine are handle with all this uh, degenerative uh, disease and all other kind of diseases which are not uh, uh, treatable at the current stage. And uh, one of the main uh, ideas or uh, our, our, our approach in regenerative medicine, I think is uh, cell transplantation. And uh, when we're talking about cell transplantation, it's very important to think about how to get the cells, right? So of course you can get the cells from donors. I mean, this you can always do. But I think if we're talking about the technical wise, you are thinking about uh, uh, different, uh, uh, thinking about the ways independent uh, donors or kind of new ways to uh, obtain the cells. 
So if we look at the biology, the first thing you realize is uh, development, right? All, every uh, individual uh, uh, develop from uh, fertilized eggs. So, uh, egg. so, so which means like we can generate, if we understand all these biological uh, knowledges, uh, development knowledges, we can generate all types of cells uh, in, the, in the lab or in the uh, 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 petri dish. Right, so this is uh, basically the idea to follow all this differentiation uh, process. And this is uh, all depends on the stem cell. Either embryonic stem cell or out of the stem cell, uh, depends on which system you are uh, studying. So this is uh, a one approach, stem cell dependent the cell source. So I guess you all know very well. Now the actual, there's another approach. So think about all the cells in our body, they have same genome, right? So the, the different behavior or phenotype of these cells actually because of other regulation like transcription factor networks or epigenetic uh, 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 modifications. So people are thinking maybe there's a way to handle these cells or manipulate these cells so that actually you can convert from one type of cell to another type of cells. So actually uh, this is a so-called uh, uh, like you can convert fibroblasts to like let's say embryonic stem cell or pluripotent stem cell, it's a process called de-differentiation, which actually already won Nobel Prize in 2012, right? So there are other uh, uh, processes you can convert, like say fibroblasts to transdiff into hepatocyte neuron cells, etc. This is a process called transdifferentiation. So these gives you another idea how to generate uh, cells independent of stem cell. This is the topic I want to discuss today with you guys. And uh, I think to understand all this uh, stem cell independent uh, 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 process will provide new ideas to understand what's going on in vivo regeneration. And also it will provide us a new approach to generate cells for generating medicine or cell therapy, transplantation. So this is the basic the idea we are having in the in the lab. And today I will talk about the uh, the organ we are interested in. So liver is probably the uh, organ in mammalian which has the most powerful regeneration capability. So in uh, uh, in many cases you can cut the liver two thirds of the liver and the rest of the part regenerate again. And sometimes you can repeat this process in the in the in the animal for like six or five or five or six or even eight times cut and they grow back. So this is liver is really an organ has a very powerful regeneration uh, capability. But these things uh, when you have a sorry, but when you have uh, all these uh, chronic uh, 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 injuries, liver actually gets this fibrosis, cirrhosis, and they lose their uh, regenerating capability. And eventually they get, came to a uh, cancer or liver, uh, end stage liver uh, disease, like liver failure, all this stuff. And uh, uh, people believe like uh, cell therapy could be uh, one of those uh, uh, treatments for this end, uh, end stage liver disease. So uh, uh, actually in the field there are uh, two type kind of uh, therapies people think about all this uh, cell-based uh, treatment for uh, end-stage liver disease patient. One is so-called by artificial liver device. So this is uh, basically you have a patient here and the liver is uh, not working and you have reduced or uh, increased the toxicity in the blood and reduced all this albumin or other secret proteins in the patient. And the people are thinking maybe we can take uh, functional hepatocytes in a bowel react and connect it with the patient's uh, uh, blood circulation system and using device make a extra corporal uh, uh, circulation system together with the patient. And you basically have a functional liver outside the patient uh, to support the patient, right? That's the basic idea. Another idea is uh, really you transplant the cells into the liver. And the cells, uh, functional cells, will repopulate in the liver and expand in the in the in the in the liver. And this is a real hepatocyte transplantation. But when you think about these two uh, approaches, they all demands uh, demand uh, functional expandable human hepatocytes. So the the question now is uh, how do we get hepatocytes, right? 
And uh, when, uh, so I show you now an uh, image of uh, uh, cultured human hepatocytes, very beautiful epithelial cells on the uh, microscope. You can see them, right? So very interesting. Uh, when you get these cells from the donors, of course, we have limited number of donor organs. When you culture these cells, because uh, we know the liver has a very strong capability to proliferate, to regenerate. But these cells, when they leave the, uh, the, the liver, when you put them in vitro culture, they don't proliferate. They simply don't proliferate. Yeah, so it's, uh, it, this is a very, very, very difficult technique to expand them in, in the culture. So this has been a long, long time. So if we have limited source of donor organs, we have a problem to expand these cells, what should we do now, okay? So back to a long time ago, almost 20 years ago, people are developing uh, all these uh, techniques to uh, uh, differentiate uh, pluripotent stem cells into hepatocytes. Uh, I think Ludwig also involved in all the, this uh, uh, discovery of these methods. Uh, and this is, uh, works very nicely in vitro, in culture, in the lab. And later on, when we, people uh, uh, Yamanaka using Yamana factor, they can convert somatic cells into stem cells. They can now use even like uh, 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 mature cells uh, to reprogram them and then de differentiate them to hepatocytes. And I mean, this protocol uh, is working, but uh, uh, when you really uh, using this protocol, you find like it's multiple step uh, procedure. It's kind of complicated. And it's really difficult to scale up of, uh, to, of these cells you get. And this uh, to scale up is very important. Just think about the liver in an adult is about 1.5 kilogram. And one gram of tissue uh, have, have, has around one and to eight cells. So, so you roughly people usually using 5% of the total liver mass for transplantation. And this will be like to 10 to 10, uh, 10 to 10 cells. This is a really huge amount of cell. So we really, to use this to scale up that, to that amount, it's almost impossible. I don't know if we have the technique nowadays to scale up to that. So then I came, uh, it came to our mind is that how, whether we can do all this trans differentiation instead of, uh, di dif uh, instead of different programming and differentiation. So this is actually uh, back to already 10 years ago in our lab, we managed to uh, generate uh, mouse tail tip fibroblasts from mouse tail tip fibroblasts and uh, all explain these uh, uh, transferring factors which are enriched in the hepatocytes box A3, HN1-alpha and GATA4. And we convert these cells, uh, these cells into hepatocyte-like cells in two weeks. And also, uh, we can manage the uh, uh, human fibroblast, either umbilical cord, fi uh, cord fibroblast or skin derived uh, fibroblast by overexpression, a slightly different combination of uh, factors FOX A3, HF1 alpha, and HF4 alpha. We can convert these uh, human fibroblasts into uh, uh, hepatocytic cells. We call them high HAP cells in two weeks. So, <clears throat> After we managed this, we did one very important thing to compare the I, uh, IPS cell or ES cell derived hepatocytes with the trans differentiating uh, uh, derived, uh, trans differentiation derived hepatocytes. To do this, we take the same donor umbilical fibroblasts and then when in one experiment, we convert them using Yamanaka factor to IPS cells then differentiate them using the uh, protocol by uh, developed by David Hay in uh, University of Edinburgh. And uh, in another experiment, we take the same, uh, same donor, uh, umbilical cord fibroblast UCF from same donor and the trans differentiate them using our uh, factors to high HAP cells. Then we ask if they, what's the, any, is there any difference between these two types of cells? From most of the assays we are performing in the lab, they seem quite similar. Either morphologically, you see they are very similar epithelial cells. High HAP cells are smaller compared to the IPS derived hepatocytes. The, in terms of the drug metabolism, let's say this CYP3A4, the, 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 they clean testosterone more or less at the same efficient. And uh, in terms of uh, secret protein, like, such as albumin, 
uh, AAG, they are producing more or less the same amount. And then when we transplant these cells in vitro, uh, in vivo, we repopulate uh, the mouse and uh, rescue some of them, not all of them, part of them in the uh, experiment. So from the, uh, uh, all these acids, we can tell they are very similar. Of course, uh, iPS cell derived hepatocytes a little bit immature. They express all these uh, AFP, all these genes which are not expressed in high cells. And the high cells are in short of uh, this uh, 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 phase two uh, metabolism a little bit compared to the iPS cells. But uh, if we look at the overall, I think they are very similar, 90 percentage are similar or something like this. So <clears throat> then we think whether we can use these cells now for any kind of this, in, uh, these two applications. We choose the uh, ball system as the first thing to use uh, all these cells, put them into a bioreactor of this ball system and connect them into a patient or in the animal study. Why we use ball? Because we, trans uh, we overexpress these factors they use the lentivirus, and the lentivirus integrate, uh, uh, the, 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 these genes will be integrated into the, the genome of the fibroblast. And it's not a controllable way to, you don't know where all these uh, transferring factors integrated. So it will be, for us, it will be much safer to use a, a ball, because in this case, you put the cells outside of patient in the bowel react, and you also can uh, put some kind of semi-permeable membrane uh, between the patients and between uh, the patients and the, the bowel react, so that you really separate the cells from the patients. But you just keep the, the, the blood or the plasma uh, circulate between the patients and the cells to like exchange the materials. So to do that, we started from the mouse to pigs and to patients. So the one apparent difference is the size of these animals, uh, these uh, species. Let's say in mouse, you need a 10 to seven, to pig, you need it to 10 to nine, in human, you need 10 to 10, right? And for mouse, we did the first experiment. Uh, uh, we actually cannot make a very tiny ball system for mouse, but we have kind of uh, uh, another uh, alternative way. We, we encapsulate these uh, cells and we transplant these cells, the uh, peritoneal, to, into the animal and to ask whether, in this case, it's mimic the, the ball, whether they can rescue the, the animal. So we induce uh, uh, liver failure in these animals by a con A. Kong A is a plant uh, uh, protein derived from plant, which induces very strong uh, hepatitis in the animals, and which kills animals very quickly uh, because of the liver fat, all this stuff. And in, in the control experiment, we use either fibroblast or another uh, cell line called a HEPG2. Why we put HEPG2? Because in, in, in back to the Now we can now really expand these cells to high amount, up to 10 to 9, 10 to 10. This will be sufficient for uh, treatment in either in a pig, a small mini pig, or to a patient. So now <clears throat> we did the one first experiment is uh, using the real ball system pig. So in this case, we induce a liver failure in gal. Okay, so then uh, the, the animals will uh, uh, develop for this liver phenotype, a liver failure phenotype within a few days, and they die usually. And uh, in the experiment, we're using the control group, we use an empty ball treatment. 
So which means uh, you have all this uh, uh, system connected, but without the functional cells in the bioreactor. Okay, it's an empty ball with cells. And in the uh, experimental, we put the high hyper cells into the bioreactor so that the, there's a functional cells connected with the uh, liver failure animal. So if you look at the survival curve of these two groups, the empty ball group, they die, of course, within a week. And the high hyper ball uh, uh, group, they survived, they have around almost 8% of animals survived in this experiment. The difference from the mini pig and the mouse will say, because we can put more cells now to treat the, uh, the animals. And also then the next step is to human. To do that, we really need to do, go through this, all this GMP facility and you need all this whole system to make sure quality. It's very complicated. It's not doable in the lab. So we collaborate with a company called Hexel in China, and they are using all these things uh, for us. And we can using these cells for a kind of uh, in, uh, investigate initiate uh, trail in, in China. It's a hospital in Hangzhou called Sir uh, Shaoran uh, Hospital, which is actually funded by uh, 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 this guy in Hong Kong, and. Uh, <coughs> So the, the patients we are, uh, for this uh, uh, IIT, we are using actually, uh, they uh, uh, undergo this extended partial hectomy. Uh, a patient with liver cancer, they come to the clinics, they need to some kind of liver resection. Sometimes the tumor are so big, so you have to cut really a large part of the liver, and you leave only a very small portion of the liver. And this will be dangerous for sometimes for the patient because the patients are usually they have some background uh, liver disease. So if you cut such a huge amount of uh, uh, liver, some of the patients will undergo liver failure. Not that much, but some of them. And we think when we talk with these surgeons, they think maybe the ball system can support the patient and they can make them much regrowth or regenerate much better. So that's the basic idea. And uh, so we enrolled seven patients in the last two or three years. And uh, the primary endpoint is to make sure that uh, the whole system is safe. It's not, uh, the my primary is not to look at the safety. And the secondary endpoint is the preliminary efficacy uh, evaluated by recovery of liver function or rate of re regeneration. And we treat the patient with six up to six hours of ball treatment. So let's first look at the, whether it's safe for the whole treatment. So we've, uh, overall, we reported uh, three adverse events, uh, and all these are manageable in the clinics. So the doctors, they don't think it's a, a, a big issue for the patient. So they basically believe the whole treatment is tolerable for the patient, for these kind of patients after surgery. So let's then look at the second primary point, the FX. So this is a, a single arm open label uh, study. So basically in this case, you cannot uh, do a, bl a blinded uh, study and uh, you cannot uh, you recruit the patients as a control because it's not ethically not uh, allowed it. So what we do is we take some patients in the meantime enrolled, uh, when we are enrolling, uh, enroll, uh, enroll these patients. Some other patients, they don't receive any uh, uh, ball treatment, just a normal uh, standard of care in the, in, the, in, the, in the clinics as a kind of uh, uh, control. It's not a really real control, I will uh, claim this. So if we look at the, the ALT levels, so in the ball treatment, the red line, they reduce skids a little bit better compared to the control group, uh, not the real control, the, the another cohort. And if we look at the volume of the uh, liver regrowth, uh, the red uh, line uh, cohort, they regain this uh, river mass much faster compared to the, uh, the other crew, uh, not, not statistically significant, but you see the trend, okay. And uh, I will show you one case, patient uh, number one, which has this rotic liver, and they have a 60% of liver cut. You cannot cut more by the guidance in China. So you have 40% of liver uh, left. And you see here in this case, they get this ALT level growth very fast after the surgery. 
and after treatment, it reduced very quickly also, and the total bilirubin levels reduced after the, uh, the treatment. And the, another important thing is the ammonia. For these kind of patients, because you cut the liver, the ammonia goes up very dramatically, very fast to after surgery. And after treatment, it reduced also. And uh, the liver also regenerates. So I won't make too much big uh, conclusion based on these data because it's not controlled. It's only like to see some kind of uh, kind of hints like uh, you see like maybe, it, I mean, it, it doesn't get worse, right? It, it, it's better, right? So it's give us confidence. It's not like something you do bad to the patient and it seems like the patients have recovered better. So then we have more confidence to go to the next phase. Another thing I would like to say, all these are the IIT uh, study. In China, IIT's uh, data are not really, uh, you, I mean, uh, considered for this IMD, I mean, which is a more real uh, uh, clinical study. So the good thing is uh, we got IMD enabled by CD. It's a, a, a department similar like FDA, the state's CD is in China last year. So. I'm proud that we can really initiate uh, the first clinical trial using trans differentiated cells in clinics, uh, probably the second half of this year. So we'll see what we have in the, this real. So if we look at the history, like we spent almost 10 years working on this IHAP cells and HIHAP cells, human, then the anim large animal experiments, then we collaborate with the uh, HEC cell, initiated IIT, now we have IND. So meanwhile, we have all some kind of publications. And this, I, I'm really like, uh, feel like, uh, uh, because I'm uh, originally, I'm a very basic cell biologist. But during these years, I realized uh, this is also very important to translate to the studies. And uh, all these things, uh, I mean, if really we can help the patient. I think what we found in the lab is uh, something kind of meaningful for the society. So have done all this in uh, trans differentiation and the ball system. I think uh, the original dream of uh, us are not uh, uh, yet uh, be true because uh, we cannot use these cells for transplantation in patients. As I explained to you, they have all this integration. Uh, they have been uh, converted by virus, antivirus and the transcription factors are uh, integrated randomly in the genome. And we have to immortalize them, even activate PP3 and RB, all these things. And I think I will be worried if I put them into, directly into the, the liver of a patient. So what we should we do now? Can we really generate some cells, I mean, much more safe compared to trans differentiation and which we can really use for transplantation, okay? So if we want to do this, I think we will still go back to the nature to learn from the liver regeneration because liver really, if you look at all this in vivo, very powerfully. So, so what we do? Uh, so if we look at the, uh, the liver regeneration, we actually uh, write, uh, wrote a, a review in 2020 to go through all these possible uh, way, uh, uh, mechanisms, how liver cells, hepatocytes are regenerated after injury. So if you look at the, this cartoon, each, actually each, each, each of these arrowhead gives you one possibility to regenerate the hepatocyte. Okay, so it's a really actually very complicated uh, uh, process of liver regeneration. But I will not bother you about all these uh, arrowheads. I will only talk about uh, the differentiation of hepatocytes to liver progenitor cells during this whole process. So which means what, what, when I'm talking about the differentiation of hepatocytes to liver progenitor cells, what, what, what do I mean, right? So this is actually in the liver, all the hepatocytes are mature, terminally differentiated. When you injure the liver, let's say you using have a DDC, it's a chemical induced cholestatic liver disease. In this scenario, uh, Ben Steng uh, has discovered a long time ago some mature hepatocyte, which is HM4 positive. HM4 is the, the transcription mature hepatocyte transcription factor. These uh, hepatocytes start to express SOX9. SOX9 is a marker for progenitor cells. Okay. So then the mature hepatocytes 
gain some of kind of features of progenitor cells. So this is uh, people say it's like a reprogramming or de differentiation of this mature hepatocyte to progenitor-like cells. So these progenitor-like cells are not only express uh, uh, SOX9, uh, this uh, progenitor marker, they express more all these so we call RRG genes, uh, reprogramming related genes. So these genes are a whole set of around 200, 300 genes. They are enriched in uh, liver progenitor like cells after the injury. And very importantly, very importantly, these 200 or 300 genes, they are also enriched, very specifically enriched in hepatoblasts. Hepatoblasts are the progenitor cells in fetal liver during development. So which means uh, all these uh, uh, differentiated LPLC cells, they are expressing a whole, a 200, 300 uh, genes, gene set, a set of genes specifically expressed in fetal progenitor cells. These are very important, right? So it's not simply overexpress uh, one signature genes, uh, one uh, mark genes for progenitor, but a whole set of genes. And uh, there are another important experiment data is when we try to trace these cells. So in, in the injury, you can label in these cells, these LPLT cells, and then you ask the fate of these cells. So you'll realize they contribute not only to hepatocytes, but also to coronal sites. So they are bipotential, bipotential. So which means they are progenitor cells because progenitor, liver progenitor cells, they can give rise both to hepatocytes and uh, coronal sites. And we demonstrate uh, a few years back, 20% uh, of newly formed hepatocytes are derived from these LPLC cells, okay. So this is a really a contribution, um, a good part of the, the regeneration come from these LPLC. So to us, it's, uh, and also if you look at the patient, you found the strong correlations. When you look at these uh, patients, uh, liver disease patients take their uh, specimens and uh, make staining of SOX9, H, and 4 alpha, you see many of these uh, disease, uh, liver, disease livers have all these uh, double positive cells. So all these data indicate LPLC cells, the de differentiation process is very important for liver regeneration. And if we study this uh, whole process much carefully, we under, when we know more about this whole process, probably we have a better way to boost the regeneration in vivo, or probably we have a better way to manipulate in vitro, maybe because the progenitor cells, they have, usually have strong proliferation capability compared to the mature bottles. Maybe we can manipulate them better in vitro, right? So this is a basic idea. I will not go all these things, I, but I will go one thing today is uh, what's the trigger for this uh, uh, LPLC formation. So liver cells, are, uh, hepatocytes are situated in a complicated uh, neighborhood with all different type of cells, let's say cellular cells, uh, endocellular cells, immune cells, all these uh, this stuff cells are in the neighborhood of the hepatocytes. So what will be the cell? What will be the signal from these cells to trigger the the reprogramming or de-differentiation of the hepatocytes. To do this, we have to do a single cell. So we want to collect all the information about all these, uh, uh, what's going on with these uh, injured hepatocytes. So the idea is to look at the hepatocytes and check the response happening in the hepatocytes. Then you can go back to see what's, uh, what could be the cells uh, uh, activate them. So when we look at these uh, hepatocytes during the injury and the reprogramming, so you see all this uh, single cell, I, I will not go all these detail, but you see this very nice the curve they from here to here, the, this is uh, basically the, the fate of them. But if you put them in a more simple way, you can do all this computational biology. So you see like they, you put them in a pseudo time, it's not a real time, it's a pseudo time, but they sit very nicely one after another, so LPLC will be here, and these cells we call the pre-LPLC, and these we call post-LPLC. If we look at the LPLC cell, because they have all these progenitor features, and they lose all these liver functional genes, and they are proliferated better, so they have a cell cycle increase. And if you look at the other uh, uh, important signaling pathways, you see notch, you see wind. Okay, these are very important uh, regulators for hepatocyte to proliferate or to do all these things. And we'll come back to these uh, pathways in the later of, of the talk. 
But another very interesting thing is about this immune inflammatory response. So if you look at this response, so so the the injury pre-injury uh, LPLC cells are a little bit increased, and the injured hepatocytes actually they are not uh, expressed so much, but LPLC strongly enhances this, and post LPLC is reduced again. Just think about all these cells actually situated in more or less the same microenvironment. But LPLC seems to respond to all this is much stronger. So we guess they have a kind of uh, hypothesis at that time. There must be something also involved in the inflammatory signal in this thing. So to address that, we want to first to take this immune cells from the injured livers and ask which inflammatory or immune cells is very important for this cell. So we take first the uh, 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 T cell, B cell, and NK cells using this uh, knockout, double knockout mice, RAC2, interleukin-2 receptor, gamma C mice, and they don't have T cells, as you can see, T cells compared to control T cells is missing, B cells are missing, and NK cells are missing, and then we ask what happened to these uh, uh, reprogrammed cells. There's no difference, so which means T cell, B cell, NK cells are not important for this process. And uh, also we can deplete neutrophils with antibody. So after the antibody treatment, you see there's uh, no neutrophils in the experimental group compared control, but there's no difference between these uh, LPL cells in two groups. So neutrophils are not uh, required for this process. So while, how about macrophages? We can deplete macrophages using uh, uh, colonginate, so uh, if you de depict a uh, uh, macrophage nicely in the experimental mice, there are dramatically reduced macrophages resident in the cells, and uh, the, the SOX9 HFR double protein cells reduced into uh, half. So which means uh, at least they contribute to half of the, the whole process. There are also other signals coming, of course. And uh, uh, we want to know which is the uh, macrophage in, the, in this whole process. Because when you're talking about the lymph macrophage, there are two types, after injury, two types of macrophage. One is called the resident macrophage, is uh, Cooper cells. This is, uh, they, they are there since the development. The other part is the monocyte derived uh, macrophage, which comes uh, uh, from the blood during the injury, okay? So you can deplete uh, or inactivate, uh, deplete macrophage using this, this cell uh, uh, mouse line uh, very nicely depletes uh, Cooper cells. I don't show you the data. Then you reduce half of the SOX9 HN4 alpha protein cells, which fits with the data where I show you with clonginate. If we're using CCR2, which uh, actually uh, blocks the, the recruitment of monocyte, uh, monocytes from the blood, so then you have no change in the double protein cells. So you indicate the resident Cooper cells are very important in this case. So then we now want to know which is the factor produced by all these uh, macrophages to induce uh, the reprogramming. To do that, we take a, a, a technique called a, a hydrodynamic TLV injection, which you inject the gene of, of interest, uh, you clone it in the plasmid and inject the plasmid through TLV. And these plasmid will actually be intake by the hepatocytes. So, uh, and the hepatocytes will express the gene you are interested in. So in this way, if you inject a low dose of plasmid, and the only will is a very uh, a small part of a part of the hepatocyte express these genes, because the genes we are interested, in, the proteins are interested are secreted proteins. So we take hepatocyte as a proxy to understand the function of these uh, uh, these proteins. Okay. So in this way, we can uh, we select a, a list of candidates. We have Cooper cell specific candidates. We have other informative factors, and we transplant. Uh, we inject these factors one by one to the animals to ask where, what's happening there. So when we only found like when we inject R six among those factors, R six. So you see here because the 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 the, the we have GF tag in the uh, vector. So this G cell will be la la labeled as GFB positive, and they seek predialysis. And they will induce the neighbor cells start to express SOX9, okay? Only, we only see this in, the, in this IL-6. And we can also isolate these cells, make a programming uh, expression profile analysis, and they nicely express this uh, RG genes, indicating really the IL-6 induce uh, reprogramming, okay? 
So uh, we can also inactivate our six in Kufa cells using this uh, CLEC4 query line so that uh, we reduce, uh, they, we delete the R6 almost gone in Kufa cell, or reduce the SOX9 around half. And also we can inactivate the Recept GP130 uh, in the Hapato site using uh, 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 AV induced uh, 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 deletion. Uh, in this case, we also reduce half of the, uh, of the, of the reprogramming cell. So all these data put together seems like R6 signaling from the Kufa cells is really important to trigger the reprogramming of these uh, uh, hepatocytes in vivo. But I'm saying this, I'm not uh, to exclude other possibilities. As I showed the beginning, we see March, wind, and also from these data, you will realize there, are, there should be other signals to trigger this reprogramming, okay? So this is like, uh, uh, at least in this study, showing the inflammation is very important for reprogramming, contribute half of the, this. So by knowing this, then we think maybe we are now ready to do all this uh, data differentiation of the in, in vitro, right? So in vivo, we are also doing something to, to put the re reprogram. So in vitro, we probably can manipulate all these things. So basically, uh, very interesting, like uh, when we are submit all these paper, so a group uh, uh, from a study from one of our friends in Shanghai, they reported our six, of course we know this before they publish. So they found that when they publish, put our six in the culture, they can extend the mouse hepatocytes dramatically, very long term. You can check the paper there, the core data there. there. So, but we know this our six a long, long time ago, of course, right? When we do all this study. But when we put our six into the culture, actually we didn't see human cells. We are talking about human cells in my lab. So we don't see that much expansion of our the human cells. So why, why? Okay, this way I come to this point later. But uh, back to almost uh, three or four years ago, uh, the project R6, we run it already seven years or something. So back at that time, we've tried that uh, because we know this wind and notch or this R6, so we are playing all these uh, factors in the culture. And we realized actually wind 3A is for in vitro very important. We have a median, we can proliferate a little bit, but we take wind 3A, they reduce proliferation. Uh, our spawning, knocking, other factors are not that important, but we put a, uh, uh, us bonding, uh, uh, knocking, uh, and uh, uh, sorry, we take all this uh, uh, us bonding, knocking, and uh, uh, another thing to activate the CMP force clean. They proliferate like really dramatic in this way. So <coughs> we then further optimize based on this winter three. We realize we got a medium called the HM, a part of that medium. And you see by BRDU incorporation, so the control, there's no BRDU incorporation, which means there's no, almost no DNA de duplicating or 2%, I also know, not know. But then in the, this HM medium, you have 20%. They are proliferating these cells. So we call these cells a proliferate HH, and we can demonstrate that in different donors, they proliferate nicely up to 10 to, uh, one, 10 to uh, sorry, 10,000 10, fold. The control you see usually like, this, yeah. So this is a really amazing for us. Like we have a median now, can expand the cell to 10,000 uh, 10, fold. So which means so take one vial of cell, which is usually uh, 10 to six or 10 to seven, and you expand them to 10 to uh, 10,000, which will be 10. To... Okay. So one vial you can expand to one patient. That's the basic idea. So then we, because we have the idea is uh, these cells could be a little bit immature, uh, they differentiating at the very beginning. So we plotted these cells in 2D, uh, the expression profile in 2D. Then you, you see primary uh, apatocyte here, little progenic cell here, they are in middle. But they never get rich. These are from different batches of cells. The more long you culture them, they close to the LPS, but never go to the little progenic cell. But they are in a middle way good enough to expand them already in large quantity. Another very interesting thing is that when we're doing this, all this analysis, we found that R6 is ex expressed in these cells. So probably this explains why we don't R6 in the culture, because they already have something in the culture, right? So 
now we can, because they are immature uh, hepato or uh, progenic like cells, maybe we say we can remature them, get some uh, uh, maturation of, the, uh, of these cells. Then we put them into actually organoid culture stuff. And after uh, one week or something, you see like uh, they from the immature, uh, you look at the, this orange bar and the, this red bar, and this is the control, then you see they get mature genes increase, increase. Okay, so I will uh, uh, emphasize here, we have all linear bars, linear scales here. This is not a log scale, okay, all linear scales, so which means many of them are really, they can, you regain the maturity. From our experience, this is a, the one of the best, or probably the best maturity, mature cells with liver maturity. And meanwhile, the, the, the SOX9 and the CD133 are reduced the expression. So now we can really use these cells for transplantation. And in this case, we use the FH model. FH is the uh, enzyme. Without this enzyme, the liver will, uh, the, the mouse will develop a tyrosinemia. Without any treatment, they just die. But you can maintain with, uh, with NTBC is the drinking water. They are fine with all this drinking water. They can even breed in, like, uh, generate the next uh, uh, generation babies. And uh, if we remove NTBC, they die, as I said. But then you can transplant the healthy functional hepatocyte to these animals. And these cells will go into the liver, repopulate them. If they are functional, they are good in repopulation. So this is the model to really demonstrate uh, the cells, whether your cells are functional for transplantation or these things. So in the experiment we show here is uh, the control, when we remove NTBC, they die very quickly, this dot line, black dot line. And uh, we transplanted a primary human hepatocyte to these animals, this green dot line. And 70% or something, 8% survived. We also transplanted proli HH from which we cultured. And uh, roughly the same amount of uh, percentage of uh, uh, animals survive, which means the proliferators are really functional. And we have all these data because they now we just expanded them for a few culture passages, let's say six, seven, or eight passages. So not that long. We have all data showing that the genome are quite uh, okay, all these things. So we are really uh, convinced that these cells probably we can use for transplantation now. So this is uh, something we will we are doing you now in the lab. So to quickly wrap up today, I introduced you about the trans differentiation, de differentiation, two different approaches to generate these functional hepatocytes. On the trans differentiation, high half cells we have already using them for uh, for uh, for ball and bring them already to the clinical trials. Uh, trail and uh, in the pre HH. We have now the cells uh, uh, nicely expand, expand uh, in the in the in the lab, and we are really want to use these them to 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 uh, for uh, in vivo transplantation. So we'll see what will happen in the future. And uh, I will meet with acknowledge people, a lot of collaborators uh, here and there uh, in China and outside China, and this is my team, and also the founders and also uh, uh, tech cell for help uh, to produce all these cells. So I will stop here and uh, thank you for your attention. I, I think I'm still quite on time, right? <laughs> okay, thank you very much Jason, for this uh, beautiful lecture. Um, shall we start with the uh, question in the audience? Nope. It was a really impressive body of work. Congratulations to all those accomplishments. I had, you know, one of the questions I had in one of the slides um, on the BAL, mm. you did show that uh, the liver does regenerate when it's connected to the BAL. Um, and there was even maybe one slide before, even, or uh, Which one? there. So the liver that are, the, the, the patients are connected to the high BAL. I don't know if this is significant, but there's a little no. bit of liver regeneration. No. No. So the idea is like this. So you have the patient undergo surgery. 
So you cut uh, such a huge amount of liver. So probably they have the chance to develop liver failure. That's why we say maybe we can do something at this stage to support the, 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 the uh, in this critical time to support them, make the liver function. All this is a uh, post the treatment. So we don't know if the, the effect will last long. These are just to show like, uh, as I said, like, uh, because we have this thing um, open. Like, so the patients, they know they have this treatment and they will have no control in the study, uh, in this uh, whole design, because this is uh, just on the safe, right. safety. So all these, uh, the other cohort is use the patient, uh, more or less at the same time we are doing all this study. So some patients, they agree that we can use their, yeah. their, their blood samples to do this yeah, study. I, so I, it's a comparison, not really a control. It's a, just a, something to sh tell us that we are yeah. not doing worse or more or less same, something like this. I, yeah. I think I think in the future, it could still be interesting in kind of furthering the clinical trial if there is you know some advantage in liver regeneration, because then you could actually yeah, learn yeah, from yeah, it yeah, yeah, yeah. and then kind of reverse engineer yeah, 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 what yeah. what 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 is uh, helping in the liver regeneration. But the BAL does not have any permeability that allows any secreted factors from yeah. the from the uh, uh, kind of separated cells to to go to the patient. Like, how does that work? Is it permeable? Yeah, 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 yeah. very good question. So the cells they produce a huge amount of uh, protein, different types of form the kind of uh, mass spectrum from the supernatum, like hundreds of protein you can see there. But we don't know which one will be the most important for the patient. So so we we, we actually, for the MOA of this ball, we're still so clear which will be the main uh, 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 factor or which will be the main function of these cells in supporting the liver failure patient. We, we just know like uh, several things outcome uh, from this treatment. One thing is uh, reduced inflammation. Second thing is uh, enhanced uh, proliferation and also the cell death uh, during liver failure are kind of reduced. And the recently we are doing some other things and uh, we, we, we realize that there's a, so during liver failure, you have uh, the, the, the crosstalk between gut and the liver. And it uh, seems like uh, the ball treatment or this uh, cell therapy can somehow end up reduce the, the endotoxin from the gut to the liver, reduced, you know, unpublished data. It just seems like this. We're still working on this. So the exact MOA are not clear for us at this stage, yeah. Um, we're going to take a few questions online and go back in uh, on the... There's one online question from Nicolas Pereira. Um, I think you, you said it in passing, but uh, maybe you can uh, reiterate. What are the delivery methods for the transcription factors? Um, in, uh, transcription factors yeah. to deliver. Okay. So it's here. So here. So I guess he's asking oh, this, this figure. So, so the transcription factors, uh, it's mainly because uh, you have taken the fibroblast. So by overexpression, transcription factors enriched in the hepatocytes, they uh, actually drive the fibroblasts to convert from one cell identity to another cell identity. In this case, from fibroblasts to hepatocytes. Okay, that's the message we uh, want to tell people. Okay, this is called a uh, transdifferentiation. Yeah. So it's lentivirus based, right? Lentivirus, yeah, lentivirus, retro, retrovirus, lentivirus based. Yeah. Can I also have a question? No. Uh, so, so you mentioned the interleukin six, right? So, and you, you, um, your idea is that there's interleukin six in the human system already in the in the process by in the culture. Yeah. Uh, have you measured uh, whether you have phosphorus three really activated? Because it reminds me a little bit oh, yeah, about yeah. the situation yeah. of embryonic stem cells, right? So, LIF works in the mouse but doesn't work in humans, right? Although you can see the activation of the three, but uh, it doesn't really work. So maybe right. there's something behind it, which yeah. is something different uh, connection in the human system be behind the stat three system rather than in the, uh, than, than in the mouse. Yeah. So. Thank you, thank you for the question. Actually, I didn't get to that deep. Uh, good question. We didn't look at the phosphorus phase three, but we'll in vivo. 
north put it with uh, up. But uh, in the culture we didn't look at, I will, uh, I will check. <laughs> I uh, thank you for the question because the uh, uh, important information yeah. is not check all this information. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. I have no answer so far for your question. Sorry. So, so some of your postdocs have some work to do when they come back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <Some audio project. laughs> okay, so uh, Carla, please. So thank you very much for this uh, interesting speech. And my question is also related to interleukin six. Okay. Uh, I don't know, I might be uh, wrong, but uh, um, I remember that interleukin-6 is a major player of acute inflammation. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if uh, uh, this mechanism can also be translatable to uh, cirrhosis uh, and uh, the chronic liver disease in, uh, yeah. in human. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good question. So when we uh, send the paper for <laughs> revision, one of the review asked the we have found the same thing in other injury systems because we use only this uh, closed static uh, injury model to see because in this model you see a lot of this reprogram. So uh, 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 one of the first authors, uh, he did an experiment to look at the APAP induced uh, injury. I think he found something also there. So, but it's very preliminary. I, I think it's more transient compared to the DDC model. But if you look at the, the human samples, you see they are always there, like uh, always there. And uh, I, my guess is uh, probably, I mean, they will do something also in other injury uh, conditions. But maybe it's a question also for the audience, no? But what, what is the level of IL-6 in human during chronic liver injury and progression like macular blemash? I don't know if you know the, the answer. Or, so, so, no, uh, so the, what, what would be the level of IL-6 uh, no, uh, in, in human during uh, progression of nafilinage? Do you see a correlation? Does it increase? Does it, no, is it very high? We didn't do a lot of this. Because IL-6 is an uh, inflammatory factor, very important for this uh, cytokine storm. So, I guess it does two ways, probably depends on the, because if you look at the, 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 the expression of these uh, in this model, they are more local uh, expressed, this uh, IL-6. But if we really boost them into the liver, I will, I will a little bit worried about this. Uh, we did actually this experiment to, to, to overexpress IL-6 or inject the proteins to the animal, they die. You cannot do this directly to your animal. You must find another way to do it uh, to to protect you. With we have some idea in the lab. We are doing this nowadays. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Frank, please. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Great talk. I also have a question about the IL six story. I was not very surprised about IL six because I mean those data are twenty yeah. years old or so. That yeah. IL six induces liver regeneration yeah, yeah, yeah. and it all yeah. depends on GP one thirty. Yeah. What I found really surprising and probably not really well explained why all of a sudden the Cooper cell should be the main provider for hepatocyte reprogramming yeah. and not the monocyte ref macrophages. Yeah. And I would really guess it depends on your model. Yeah. The DDC model is very strange in, in many aspects. Okay. It okay. has like a very strong ductal reaction. It's very different from, from all types of also not really comparable to human cholestatic okay. diseases. Yeah. So I would yeah. be really concerned that this is very model specific and that yeah. the fact with the monocyte ref macrophage Cooper yeah. cells is uh, related to the model. Uh, this I, I fully agree with you. So we discussed in the paper, like uh, could be very limited to the model. But that I mean, the main uh, message is to say like inflammation is connected with the reprogramming, and also you have some kind of uh, uh, way to manipulate the cell fate by all these. Uh, and I would have a second question to your first part of the talk. How long does it take you to expand uh, or to transdifferentiate um, towards hepatocytes? Because I was wondering in your in your bell device, you could also like if you do a liver surgery, you know in advance, probably even a couple of weeks in advance. Yeah, so yeah. you could even use an autologous oh, yeah, system yeah, yeah. and maybe be even more yeah, yeah. or less immunogenic yeah, yeah. Or, or something more physiological. Uh, if it's relatively fast to expand the hepatocytes or to, to generate the hepatocytes from fibroblasts? So, yeah, so we are not, uh, so the, the question quick answer is uh, we need uh, two weeks to convert. 
then expanded them to large quantity in two to three weeks. So we are not doing like autologous uh, treatment. We're using uh, uh, one uh, hepatocytes, uh, these uh, high hep cells from one donor, umbilical cord fibrous, to, to convert them. So it's all, all like a uh, universe. Uh, and we can freeze these cells. So it's uh, like uh, on shelf. So if you have a patient that you call, then they get the cells immediately in, in, your, in your clinical, yeah. Okay, we have another question in the room and after we'll go online to take two questions. Uh, I just want to um, elaborate on the IL-6 and chronic liver disease story because I remember there, there was a paper from the Bengal group in, I think, 2020, where they developed a specific model where they first induced a chronic liver injury. Then on top of that, they induced um, a sterile hit with a double dose of CCL4. And then there was another sequence where you had an infection. Right, so you have like the, what you what you observe in humans. You first have the chronic injury, then you have a hit, and then you have an infection. Okay. What they observed that like in after the second acute hit, which was sterile, you have an IL six response and quite a lot of regeneration. But once you have this inflammation, they switched from a start three activation into a start one activation, and there was a complete block of proliferation. Okay. So my feeling is like when you trans translate that into the human situation, probably in these situations where you have cirrhosis and really an activated immune system, et cetera, mm -hmm. that it becomes deleterious, maybe not the IL-6 itself, but maybe there's a switch of other factors like mm -hmm. taking over the, the effect and it's more deleterious effect. Yeah. That was my feeling. And I was wondering when, you, when you're trying to, to transplant these transdifferentiated hepatocytes into such an environment, which is, I mean, more like a battlefield, do you, do you feel that these cells, they, they keep their phenotype or is there a chance that they even lose the phenotype because there's so much ongoing? So for the first uh, commentary on IL-6, I mean, I fully agree with uh, all this uh, from Frank. And we, I think like IL-6, uh, like for a long, long time ago, they do this uh, partial hepatomyase study. They realize IL-6 can contribute to regenerate. But at that time, people don't know what's going on with uh, this IL-6. The mechanical level is it, it's not clear. There are some people claim like, uh, all this uh, based on uh, cell death or something like this. And the, the, I think the, the, the leading author, actually, she's not in company, Roche or somewhere. She's not working on this basic science, yeah. So I have no, I mean, I fully agree. They are more complicated than we think. But, but in this study, we have to, I mean, really focus on one thing, like regeneration. We, this is the first thing we understand, like in vivo, you have this fact to induce the programming. For the second thing, a question you are asking about uh, the, all these pro hh when we transplant into the, all this uh, injured liver, all this uh, end stage liver, what will happen to them? Because the environment is uh, terrible already, like a lot of inflammation going on. So, so uh, if you look at the hepatocyte transplantation, the history of uh, hepatocyte transplantation, people are thinking about the first thing they test is in genetic uh, liver disease, not in this uh, inflammatory end liver, end stage uh, liver failure patient. So we will probably follow the same route. I will take uh, genetic disease as the first thing to test if this uh, functionally okay, if it's uh, doable also in the liver. Because think about the solid organ, it's the liver. You have all the cells inside. So if the new cells go, go to the liver, they have to, some cells should go away or die to leave the space for the new cells. There's competition between these two types of cells. So this is already something very difficult. So we want to go for liver genetic disease at the early stage of probably not that much inflammation and find the proper precondition way to remove some of the cells and get the, let the new cells inside. And I think it will be a very long way and a lot of, needs a lot of collaboration. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so we have two, two, so what I will say is that we go online because people in the audience know we can, uh, we have uh, after know some food and lunch and you could, uh, you can ask directly your question to uh, Legion, okay? So, so, so I just want to give the opportunity for the online uh, right. audience to ask questions. So there are two questions online. One is from Michael. Have you tried growing di your directly reprogrammed cells in the expansion medium containing the extrinsic factors you identified? Uh, Transdifferentiated cells in, in the 
expanding. Uh, no, no, we didn't try this. No, no. Okay, and, and there's a second question from Mohassan. Uh, do you separate the patient's plasma from the toxins before it mixes with the support coming from the BAL? Uh, second, second question, since BAL is it, sorry. Can you repeat the first question? Did I field? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Take the plasma. From yeah, the do you separate the yeah, yeah, patient's yeah. plasma from yeah. the toxins? No, no, no toxins. I mean, you cannot separate the toxins from the plasma. It's uh, mixed already there. It's, uh, It's a kind of uh, function. It's a bowel reactor, which we put the cell. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so where, if we don't speak into the microphone, they can't hear this online. Okay. So, it's always the problem. Uh, and the, there's a second question from Hassan. Uh, second, since BAL is a transient support, how often do you need to replace the cells in the BAL? Yeah, yeah. So we are trying to do is uh, now the, the the real fail will take uh, nine hours for one treatment, then we repeat it uh, once or twice a week or something like this, depends on how it uh, come, uh, the outcome of the patient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have all these designed uh, clinical protocols. We can, I can de explain detail if the guy is interested, just contact me. Well, each time you produce a new uh, device with new cells, or you can reuse it several No, times. you cannot reuse yeah. You have to every time. Uh, yeah, use, try, use use the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. The infection will be... Uh, some problem if you use you it. keep it wrong. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so what I, I would propose that we uh, stop here because now we are over time already. Mm -hmm. The audience, please, if you want to ask more questions, interact with the speaker, stay. We have a bit of food and you can interact. And before we leave completely, I just want to announce the next BIH lecture, okay, yeah. which will happen the 21st yeah. of April. So, thank you, guys. So, so thank you. Thank you. Lots of new ideas. Okay, so the next uh, BH lecture is on the 21st of April, 12 to 1 p.m. It's Chantal Pichon uh, from the CNRS uh, in uh, Orléans, I think. And uh, she will talk about uh, gene therapy and uh, in, in, in regenerative medicine. Uh, and uh, please join us for this uh, next speaker. Thank you very much for your attention and for joining us. Thank you.